Yeah, so today I'm excited to share some of the work that my lab has been doing at Stanford on nonlinear impacts of climate change on dengue transmission. And for those of you who are not as familiar with this, vector-borne diseases, dengue of course is a vector-borne disease, so it's a disease transmitted by a biting arthropod, in this case a mosquito. Vector-borne diseases include diseases like malaria, yellow fever, West Nile, tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease, lots of other diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes, ticks, flies, and fleas. And these types of diseases are really important from a global health perspective because, of course, they cause hundreds of millions of cases per year and hundreds of thousands of deaths per year. So they're very important from a public health standpoint. But they're also very interesting from an ecological standpoint because these diseases transmitted by biting arthropods really depend on the ecology of the environment and the way that it shapes the vector life cycle. And so vector-borne diseases are sort of a lens by which human impacts on the environment feed back to affect our health. And so for that reason, my lab really focuses on vector-borne disease transmission and how it's changing in response to factors like climate change. So the question we're going to be centered on today is how is climate change affecting dengue dynamics? Um, this has been an increasingly important question in recent decades because, of course, we know that the climate is changing already more rapidly than we even expected. And this is a vector-borne disease that's transmitted by a biting arthropod that's an ectotherm. So that means that its body temperature is sensitive to the environmental temperature around it, which leads us to expect that climate warming may have an impact on this disease. But understanding how a disease like dengue will respond to climate change is a bit of a challenge, in part because diseases like dengue are embedded in ecological communities. So, for example, if we, if we look over here at this diagram, we can see that uh, dengue and many other diseases are often transmitted by multiple hosts, in this case humans. Some non-human primates are also reservoirs of dengue. There's often interactions with multiple vector species. And in turn, these humans and vectors are interacting with multiple parasite species or parasite strains within the community, and multiple aspects of the environment are affecting vector transmission. And so these are complex systems. There's lots of nonlinearity here. So any one of these arrows could represent a nonlinear relationship between a species and its environment, or the emergent effect of multiple arrows could in turn generate additional nonlinearity and complexity in these systems. So predicting how a system like dengue will respond to climate change is really a challenge that requires approaches that allow us to integrate data with more mechanistic mathematical and statistical models to better understand these complex and nonlinear mechanisms of global change. So before I present more of this research, I want to take a minute to acknowledge all the funders and collaborators on these projects, including NSF, NIH, several of the Stanford institutes and centers, and all of my lab members, and as well as a long list of people who either collected the data or contributed data to this project. And today's talk is going to be broken up into four parts. So for this first one hour session, I'll present the first part, and then my colleague Jamie Caldwell will take over. And then in the second one hour session, Nicole Nova and Devin Kirk will take over and present more aspects of this interesting question about how climate change is affecting dengue. So dengue fever is a globally distributed um, disease that's caused by a virus. It's often called an arbovirus, which is short for arthropod-borne virus. And this virus, um, what I'm showing here, oops, what I'm showing here in the map is the force of infection of this virus. So force of infection is just an estimate of the transmission rate of the virus. As we can see, it's mostly constrained to the tropics and subtropics across Latin America, Africa, and primarily Southeast Asia. And it's transmitted by Aedes aegypti, which is historically called the yellow fever mosquito because it was responsible for yellow fever outbreaks historically. Now it should really be called the dengue mosquito because that's the, the most common disease it's associated with. It's a globally distributed mosquito vector that originated in Africa but spread throughout the globe during the, the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade period. The secondary vector of dengue is Aedes albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito, which has been invading more recently in the last 30 years or so from Asia into parts of Europe and North America and South America. So alarmingly, dengue... Whoops. Alarmingly, dengue is on the rise globally. If we see over here, this panel here shows the global change in dengue incidence over the last 30 years or so. 
And if we look regionally, we can see some really dramatic increases in dengue fever, particularly in places like Latin America and the Caribbean, shown here in the middle, and Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South Asia. And if we zero in on the burden of this disease, we can see that the current burden is highest in places like India, Southeast Asia, Brazil, Mexico, and other parts of Latin America. And it's estimated that there are about 390 million cases per year already of dengue. Now, not all of those infections are symptomatic. Dengue often causes asymptomatic infection, and so about 96 million people actually have symptomatic dengue fever disease. It's nicknamed breakbone fever, so it's a pretty severe disease. It's not something you want to get. Um, and we can see that this global burden is distributed pretty heterogeneously, as you can see in this cartogram that kind of squishes countries based on their relative importance for dengue transmission. So the dengue burden is already very large, it's already very heterogeneously distributed, and it's growing exponentially. The question is, how is climate change going to affect the dynamics of this disease? Well, there have been a few previous papers addressing this question. This paper came out a couple of years ago by Colón González et al. And what they're projecting is just for parts of uh, Latin American and the Caribbean, with a one and a half degree temperature warming. They're projecting a few months. So the scale down here is the number of increased months per year of transmission. So one to three additional months is in orange. Three to 12 additional months per year of transmission is in red. Um, it's not showing up super well on this screen, but you can see that there's little pockets where dengue is going to really increase, even with one and a half degrees warming. And as we increase the amount of warming that we experience to 3.7 degrees, we see really widespread expansions in transmission suitability of dengue. And if you project this onto the number of expected new cases, we could see as many as 7.5 million cases per year of dengue in Latin America. Now, this model makes some really dire and kind of alarming projections, but if you look very closely at what's underlying these model projections, there's actually no information at all in the paper or online, or if you contact the authors, about what they're actually assuming about the relationship between dengue and temperature. So we don't actually know what that underlying functional relationship between temperature and dengue is from this paper. Another recent paper, oh, that's really not showing up. Well, imagine there's a, a map of the globe there. <laughs> oh, maybe those of you on Zoom can see it a little bit better, yeah. Um, what we see in this paper is projected expansions and contractions in temperature suitability, or in, in overall risk of dengue. Um, where most of our expansions, shown in red, are occurring kind of at the fringes in parts of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. There's a few contractions by 2050, but mostly dengue is projected to expand. But despite the kind of limited geographic range of these expansions, they're projecting that about 2.25 billion more people will be at risk of dengue transmission by 2080. Now, what's the temperature relationship underlying this model? The assumption here is that transmission by Aedes aegypti is peaking around 30 or 34 degrees Celsius, I think it's 34 degrees Celsius, and transmission by Aedes albopictus, that secondary vector, is peaking at a temperature a little bit lower. But we really wanted to, to pick apart what this thermal performance relationship looks like in real mosquitoes and where this is derived from. So, and here in this model, the temperature suitability is moderated by drier conditions and vector absence. So that's the reason that these expansions are kind of restricted to just places along the fringe of the current distribution, is that this model is assuming that drier conditions and the absence of the vector currently are going to limit the spread of dengue with climate warming. But we saw a few gaps here that we found to be really important in projecting how climate change might affect dengue transmission. And that's the research that I'm going to present today. So first of all, mechanistically speaking, how does temperature affect dengue transmission? So you can see that some of the underlying assumptions in these models are either unclear or not, not very well justified. Um, so we're going to address what are the underlying assumptions and how temperature affects dengue transmission. Second, if we have a climate-driven mechanistic model of dengue transmission, can it actually predict outbreak dynamics over space and time? Third, how do nonlinear effects of climate and host susceptibility interact to affect dengue transmission dynamics? 
And fourth, are the nonlinear effects of temperature on dengue apparent in field studies? So if we have this a priori expectation that there should be a mechanistic nonlinear relationship between dengue transmission and temperature, is that actually apparent in the messy real world when we look at studies that relate dengue incidence to temperature? And then finally, what does this relationship between dengue and temperature predict about the impact of climate change in the future? So jumping into this first question, which is the main part I'll talk about for this first section, we can dive into the life cycle of the dengue vector to better understand the mechanisms underlying its temperature sensitivity. So as you may know, mosquitoes breed in bodies of water. For the case of Aedes aegypti, it's a container breeding mosquito. So it's a mosquito that breeds in small containers as small as a bottle cap, but it often breeds in containers like used tires, buckets, cisterns, mostly human-made containers. So the female lays her eggs at the side of these bodies of water. Those hatch and go through four developmental larval stages, which then pupate and emerge as adults. If we look at this life cycle, it depends on survival, fecundity, and development rate. Now the mosquito is a small-bodied ectotherm, so its body temperature is matching the temperature of the environment around it. And because of that, its metabolism is also dependent on the environmental temperature. All of these life history traits, survival, fecundity, and development rate, all depend on the metabolism of the mosquito, and therefore are expected to depend on temperature. Now, of course, the part of the mosquito life cycle that we're most familiar with is the biting. So mosquitoes have this very unusual life cycle where the females need a blood meal from a vertebrate host in order to produce their eggs. So females take a blood meal on a host, they fill up with blood, they digest that blood and convert it into eggs. The rate at which they do that is dependent on their metabolism, so it's in turn dependent on temperature. Now, the parasite, for its part, has hijacked this mosquito life cycle, and when that blood meal contains, in this case, virus, instead of getting digested and excreted out of the body, that virus is able to break through the mid-gut barrier of the mosquito, disseminate throughout the body, and bind to the salivary gland. So the next time the vector takes a bite, it's injecting saliva that's laden with virus into the next host. That's called the extrinsic incubation cycle. And as you might imagine, the rate at which the vector completes that depends on its metabolism and therefore depends on temperature. So here already we can see all the complexity in which temperature is going to affect dengue transmission because there's lots of different components of the life cycle that are affected by temperature. Not only that, but we have a pretty strong expectation for how those individual life cycle components will respond to temperature from ectotherm physiology. And what we expect here is that with temperature on the x-axis and the performance of any given life history trait on the y-axis, so this could be development or survival or reproduction, that performance is going to increase from a critical thermal minimum at a low temperature to an optimum and then decrease often very steeply above the optimum to a critical thermal maximum. So we have these hump-shaped thermal performance curves that are both expected from first principles in theory and also very widely supported across a wide range of different ectotherm taxa and traits. So this is a really well-established expectation that these traits of vectors should respond nonlinearly to temperature. And yet often in these vector-borne disease transmission models, we see, including the ones I presented earlier, we see assumptions that performance of the vector responds linearly or monotonically to temperature. And so this is a really important disconnect that we need to investigate between ectotherm physiology and vector-borne disease models. Because it's important to know where this optimal temperature and critical thermal maximum occur, and how all of these different temperature-sensitive traits combine to determine transmission. And so not surprisingly, these models that assumed a monotonic relationship with temperature often make this prediction that a warmer world is a sicker world. Because of course, more warming means higher performance of the vector life cycle and more transmission. So we want to reconcile the difference between these two models. So our approach is very simple. We start with these entomology experiments that people have done in the lab where they put mosquitoes at different constant temperatures and they measure traits involved in their life cycle, biting rate, mortality, the life history traits that underlie mosquito abundance, transmission and infection probability with the virus, and the parasite development rate, or the amount of time it takes for the parasite to get through that incubation cycle. So all of these are empirical, experimental measurements of thermal performance. We can then take those data and fit continuous thermal performance curves to them. Then we need a way of synthesizing all these different temperature impacts on the transmission cycle as a whole. 
So we can calculate a metric called R0, which you've probably heard over the, over the last couple years by now. R0 is the rate of spread of a novel pathogen into a fully susceptible population. So the classical threshold for R0 is 1. If R0 is greater than 1, a disease can successfully invade a new population. Here, we're not so much considering that absolute threshold value. We're considering R0 as a relative metric of temperature suitability. So it's a way of combining all these temperature-sensitive traits and saying how suitable is the temperature, at, at, is a given temperature for transmission. Question? Um, when you get infected with dengue, uh, do you pick up immunity? Is there an immune response that then protects you later? Uh, yeah. Just curious how, the, I mean, I, this is not necessarily relevant to this particular modeling question. I'm right. Just, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, dengue immunity is a whole really interesting complex topic. The short answer is yes, there's immunity from dengue that protects you against future infection. The longer and more interesting answer is that Kind of, but it's weird, actually, because there's four serotypes of dengue that are known now that circulate regularly in human populations. If you've been exposed to one serotype, you're immune, as far as we know, for life to that serotype. But as your antibody titers to that first serotype start to wane, at first you have cross-protection against all four. As they start to wane, there's a critical antibody threshold window where your susceptibility to the other three serotypes actually increases during that window through a process called antibody-dependent enhancement. So that's where you see the most severe cases of dengue is actually when someone gets a secondary case of dengue during a specific time window, usually about one to three years after their initial dengue infection. After that, the antibody titers decline enough that you sort of go back to baseline susceptibility to the other three serotypes. Yeah, so it's very complex, and this is something we'll get to later, is that understanding the landscape of human immunity to dengue transmission is one of the big uncertainties and complexities to understanding this. So here we're conveniently just focusing on the vector, and we're saying, what is the vector doing in response to temperature? How is the, the transmission cycle within the vector doing? Um, and, and with a model like R0, I mentioned it's, it's an invasion growth rate into a susceptible population. So here we're kind of ignoring that susceptibility piece, but we're going to be coming back to that later. That's a great question. Are there any others before I continue? Someone can let me know if there's one on Zoom. OK. Great. So R0 is our, it's our metric that we're using for temperature suitability to synthesize the temperature responses of lots of different traits of the mosquito and parasite. So this R0 expression was developed over 100 years ago by the people that originally discovered that mosquitoes were transmitting these pathogens, malaria specifically. So it, it's been adapted over the years, but the important thing to note about this expression, which we've modified a little bit, is that it's a nonlinear function of these traits of mosquitoes and parasites that are themselves nonlinear functions of temperature. So this gives us kind of a single metric of the relative temperature suitability for transmission. And you can see that it's a nonlinear function of things like biting rate, transmission and infection rate, incubation period, mortality rate, and so on. So this is the model framework that we're going to be building on today. And this is going to give us a temperature suitability metric, but it's derived from laboratory data measured at constant temperatures. So there's a lot of really important caveats here. And one of the really important things we want to know is, can this kind of mechanistic laboratory-based estimate of the temperature response of transmission actually predict what we're going to see in the field in a much messier and more complicated system? So a lot of this talk is going to be devoted to this question of understanding how we can connect mechanistic models with field-based observations. And then finally, when we feel satisfied that we've empirically validated this model, we can use it to project responses to future climate change. And kind of foreshadowing the result here, what we're going to see is that there's going to be both increases and decreases in potential transmission in response to climate change. And the degree of those increases versus decreases is really going to depend on where that thermal optimum is. OK, so here's the empirical results of this work. This is synthesizing a bunch of laboratory studies, in this case for Aedes albopictus, that secondary vector carrying dengue virus. And what you can see is that, as we expected from the ectotherm physiology literature, we see support for hump-shaped thermal responses across all of these traits that contribute to transmission. So biting rate, fecundity, survival, lifespan, lots of other traits. 
Likewise, if we look at Aedes aegypti, we see hump-shaped thermal responses across the board. So no big surprises here. If you compare these closely, you can see some differences in their shape and some differences in their thermal optima. And when we put those together to calculate a temperature-dependent r naught model for each of our two vector species, this is what we predict about how they respond to temperature. So you can see qualitatively it looks a little bit similar to one of those earlier models that I showed you. But importantly, the earlier model, the optimal temperature for Aedes aegypti was 34 degrees Celsius. Here, our optimal temperature is 29 degrees Celsius. Because here, we've lowered that optimal temperature by considering the full nonlinear relationships between lots of different vector and virus traits and temperature. So for Aedes aegypti, which is the one we're going to mainly focus on here, we have an optimum of 29 degrees Celsius. For Aedes albopictus, we have an optimum of 26 degrees Celsius. For those used to thinking in Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius is about 84 degrees Fahrenheit or so. So a fairly warm optimal temperature. OK, so just to highlight, these are the thermal optima of that previous model that I showed. So you can see that their thermal optima are pretty close to what we're estimating to be the upper thermal limit for transmission. Very big differences. Um, this model, this, this second model was published a few years after ours, so we weren't able to compare it at the time. But comparing the models that were already published at the time that ours was published, you can see that there's wide disagreement in the literature about what the thermal relationship between dengue and temperature is. So our model is shown in the blue, the Aedes albopictus, or Aedes aegypti model, and in the blue dashed line is the Aedes albopictus. And you can see all the other versions of models, um, ranging from ones that look pretty similar to our thermal performance relationship to ones that have much, much higher optima, around 35 degrees Celsius or more. Importantly, when we looked closely at these previous models, only one of them had actually been empirically validated against field data that were independent from the model that it was fit to. And that was this Wesolowski model. You might not even really be able to see it because it's kind of underneath our model. It's very similar in predictions to, to our model. So this led us to understand that model validation was going to be a really important component of this work. So in other words, comparing this type of mechanistic prediction with field observations. And so to validate the model, we used the best data that we had available at the time, which was not very good, to try to understand what the thermal relationship with dengue transmission was in the field. And the data we used are these human case data, so the number of human cases for dengue as well as chikungunya and Zika, which are two other viruses transmitted by Aedes aegypti, where we estimate that the thermal performance relationships are very similar to that of dengue. In the Americas, at the country scale from 2014 to 2016. So that's why I say these are not very good data because we don't have very local scale data. We will in some of the later parts of this talk. But for now, we're just looking at the country scale at sort of weighted averages of temperatures in the places where dengue tra transmission occurs compared to the numbers of cases. So we also expected that rates of dengue transmission would be dependent on the population size. And specifically, we wanted to know if we, if we weighted r naught of temperature by the population size in a country, how well would that predict the probability that we see local transmission, as well as, given that we do see local transmission, the magnitude of that incidence. So we fit a statistical model, or two statistical models, and what we find is that this population corrected temperature dependent R naught on the x-axis is a strong predictor of the probability of seeing a local, seeing local transmission, both for dengue, which is shown in blue, and for Zika and chikungunya, which are shown in red. So you can see the relationships have different slopes, but they both have a positive relationship with that population corrected R naught. If we look at just the places that did have local transmission, we can also see that this population corrected R naught is strongly correlated with the, the, the absolute magnitude of transmission, suggesting that this is capturing something real about the thermal signature of dengue outbreaks and chikungunya and Zika outbreaks in the field. So to summarize, how does temperature mechanistically affect dengue transmission? We see a, an estimated optimal temperature or peak temperature at 29 degrees Celsius for Aedes aegypti, 26 for Aedes albopictus. We see a permissible temperature range between about 23 and 32 degrees Celsius. And we see that outbreak risk increases with both population size and temperature suitability, which is going to be an important point that we'll return to later. OK, so this is a reminder for me at this point to hand off the talk to Jamie, who's going to take over next, and jump into talking a little bit more about whether we can now use this mechanistic thermal performance relationship to predict outbreak dynamics over space and time.
Great, thanks so much everyone and thanks for having me as well. Uh, my name is Jamie Caldwell and as Erin just mentioned, the key question that I'll talk about today in the research that we've done together is asking, can climate driven uh, models actually predict arbovirus dynamics? And so we just heard about what I think is a really elegant framework for understanding the mechanistic relationship of transmission suitability across a gradient of temperature, which has given us some really interesting insights at both broad spatial and temporal scales about what we expect with arboviral transmission. But we also recognize that the epidemic dynamics, so the variation in mosquito vectors and disease cases through space and time, particularly at local scales, are really important as well. And so just to give two, I think, probably pretty obvious examples, if we look at the top plot, this is just a pictogram of cases through time. And what you see is two outbreaks shown here. The red one, we have this really steep peak and it lasts over a short period of time. And that's relative to this blue outbreak, which is showing a longer lasting but lower burden at any given time outbreak. And as we've experienced all too closely over the last few years, these two types of outbreaks have huge differences in terms of their societal impact and how we manage them in terms of whether we overburden hospital and health agencies. In the bottom, I'm showing the dynamics of vectors through time. And one example of why that's really important is because if we can actually pinpoint where and when the vectors are likely to be most abundant and active, we can actually allow vector control agencies to pinpoint and optimize where they use their often limited resources. So from a practicality point, it's really interesting to know if we can use these mechanistic relationships to predict disease dynamics through time. And one of the reasons I think this is really useful is because while statistical models tend to do better in this sense, we have to be really careful about extrapolating to new locations or new time points. And to validate these models, we really need a lot of data and it's often not available in different locations. Um, so we were fortunate to work with some great groups of people and I'll present that work here today and what we found. So we similarly have built on about 100 years of work um, and are using essentially the most fundamental model in epidemiology, which are these group of SIR models. I imagine many of you have heard of them before, um, but I'll just take a moment to explain in case anybody's unfamiliar. So these models tend to be deterministic and they split your population into three classes or compartments where individuals at any one time can be either susceptible, infected, or recovered. And what we see in this plot is a pretty classic um, outcome of these simulations where you have time on the x-axis and number of people on the y-axis. And what we see is that that susceptible population before an outbreak or at the beginning is really high and it starts decreasing as infected individuals increase in the red line. And then people start to recover, which is shown in the blue line. So what you see is a turnover in the number of infected people because you run out of susceptibles in the population. And this very simple model, which is expressed in the form of ordinary differential equations, has been amazingly accurate at predicting disease dynamics across an incredibly wide range of diseases. Um, and so what we've done is just expanded this model. It's a really flexible framework and incorporated some of these temperature dependent traits and then predict disease dynamics through time and compare them with field observations. So this is a graphical representation of our model. It looks a lot busier than the one I just showed, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and I'll walk you through it. Um, so the top panel here describes the vector population or the mosquitoes, which are separated into three classes in the boxes, susceptible, exposed, and infected. And the human population on the bottom is likewise split into susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. The horizontal uh, arrows represent the direction that individuals can move between the compartments. Uh, the vertical arrows indicate essentially birth and death type processes. The over OV position and development is essentially reproduction and growth through the life cycle that Erin described a moment ago. And the dashed lines that connect the mosquito population and the human population represent the roots of transmission. So I think what's kind of novel in this work and what we were really excited about is to add in those temperature dependent 
traits. And so we did those in all of the locations that I've highlighted in red here. So just to show you how that works, for a susceptible person to become exposed, for example, so for this to happen, we need a susceptible person to be bitten by an infectious mosquito. And the rate at which that biting happens is nonlinear, as Erin showed before in this picture. And so we can take the ambient temperature at the time scale that we're looking at. So here, what's the temperature that day? And then based on that, we have some rate at which the mosquito is likely to bite people and transmission is likely to happen. And so at lower and higher temperatures, that biting rate's lower, and there's some mid-range temperature where it's optimized. So to start, what we did was explore in a perfect world what might happen. So this is work led by an undergraduate that Aaron and I worked with, John Huber, who's done some amazing work. And so we basically said, if we know exactly what the temperature looks like and it's behaving perfectly through a seasonal cycle, we know the human and vector population, what might happen. And from there, then we can explore, does that actually match what we see in the real world? Um, and so just for fun, I've sprinkled a couple survey questions in here. So if you'd like to participate on your phone or the computer, I have a couple questions so that you can make some hypotheses, and then I'll follow up with the results that we found. So I'll give people a minute to sign on. Um, the website is www.menti.com. And so the first question I want you to take a guess at or make a hypothesis is, uh, are larger outbreaks, when should they occur? Should they start at those optimal temperatures around 29 degrees Celsius, so in its perfect conditions? Or should it be increasing towards optimal? So you can imagine this as an outbreak starting in spring and moving into summer. Or would an outbreak be largest when you start at the optimal temperatures and then start going downward? So start at around 29 degrees, you could think summer going into fall. Okay. I'll give it. Oh, can I do that with the? Oh, maybe I'll go here. Sure. While people are answering, that's great. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask the question out loud. If oh, want. yeah. This is a great question. Um, are the infectious mosquitoes, do they remain infectious until death? In our model, yes. Uh, in reality, we're not entirely sure, but we think so. Mosquitoes, as far as we know, mosquitoes don't actually live that long in the wild, uh, but they can go through multiple reproduction cycles. And so it's, I think it's probably possible that they shed the infection. Um, but from all the data we've been able to gather as a field, not just in our labs, uh, we think they stay infected for life, and that's the assumption in the model. So great, I'm glad I have some participants, and uh, most of you are correct, and I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm not sure I would have guessed this right away, uh, which is that we do in fact find that the largest outbreaks happen as temperatures are starting to rise. So in this plot, the starting temperature is on the x-axis, and the final epidemic size is on the y-axis. And why we think this happens, and I'm guessing what most of you were thinking, is that you get both at the same time, an increase in infected individuals in the population, and as the temperatures are rising, it's increasing all those rates at the same time. Okay, so my next question is, do you think outbreaks starting at cooler temperatures should last longer or shorter than outbreaks starting at warmer temperatures? I wonder if I should have hid the answer so you weren't influenced and <laughs> peer pressured. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Okay. So what we found is that outbreaks starting at cooler temperatures are likely to last longer. And Quite a big difference, actually, as well. So again, in this plot, on the x-axis, we have starting temperature. But on the y-axis, we have epidemic length. And at very low temperatures that are still permissive to transmission, we find you should be able to get really long outbreaks, at least in this simulation. Whereas if you get to hotter temperatures, that epidemic length dis decreases quite a bit. Is that 
do you, do you understand why is that just like it takes like the length of epidemic does that also show up in like the number of overall cases the overall sort of uh how dense the case burden is over time Yes. So um, I think you started to say it in the beginning, actually, which is that everything's moving a little bit more slowly. And so the whole transmission process from, uh, you know, the mosquito biting an infected person, becoming infectious itself, and then biting another person and that person becoming symptomatic, that whole process takes longer. Um, but and so overall, at any given time, we would expect a lower burden, but you can still accumulate a large number of cases over the course of the entire outbreak. So if you have an outbreak going for 140 days, um, even if you have very few people infected every day, over time that adds up. Yep. Okay. Oh, great. We already got some answers. So uh, this is multiple choice, so you can pick more than one, uh, which might be a hint. The uh, what climates do you expect enable the largest outbreaks? Oh, my eyes are really bad, so I'll get closer. So there's four options. You could think of regions that have cooler mean temperatures but high temperature variability. What I mean there is the temperature range throughout the year, so you could think of how seasonal a location is. Um, the second is places with cooler mean temperatures but with low variability. Third is warmer mean temperatures with high variability. And then finally, places with warmer mean temperatures, but low temperature variability. This is good, we have a good mix. I'll give a few more seconds because I think we haven't reached all the people. Okay. Let me submit one answer. Oh, I might have not made it multiple choice, Did sorry. Else to submit one one? Okay. okay. Well, that's all right, this is just for fun anyway. <laughs> so there's actually two answers here. Um, the first one is the blue answer, cool mean temperatures with high temperature variability. And the second is the pink, the warm mean temperatures with low variability. Now take a few moments to explain that here with a slightly more complicated graphic. So in this uh, graph, the mean temperature is on the x-axis and that temperature range throughout the years on the y-axis. And the surface is colored by the epidemic suitability. So low suitability for uh, outbreaks is shown in dark blue and high suitability in dark red. And what we get is this diagonal band. And what that indicates is that regions with even lower, like quite low temperatures for what we would expect from those unimodal are not curves, is that if you have enough temperature variability through the year, you get into the suitable temperature range. And similarly, if you go on the other end, if you're actually close to that optimal or high, if you get too much range, you actually go off that steep peak and it makes it less suitable. And so what we've done here is just plot 20 cities around the world and where they would fall in the surface given their temperature profile. So you could see a lot are actually sort of on the edge of suitability, some are right in the middle, and some are actually getting too warm, but far fewer than the ones that are likely to move into that range with climate change. Okay. So from these simulations, we were able to learn some really interesting characteristics overall of epidemics that we think we should capture. The first is that we think we should be able to predict when outbreaks will start. We think we should be able to predict how long they'll last, how many occur in a given time period if we know when they'll start and how long they'll last, and then the relative size of those outbreaks. So then the obvious next question to ask was, does this framework explain real world dynamics with, as Aaron said, all the noise and messiness of the real world? And so we were really lucky to work with these great teams in Ecuador led by Anna Stewart Ibera and Kenya led by Desiree Lebeau at these eight sites pictured here. So of course, these two countries are in really different locations on the globe. Ecuador is in South America, Kenya is in East Africa. And uh, the sites are all close to the equator, but they have a couple different interesting variability, variation between them, I think. So they range across a gradient of climate, urbanization, and sort of endemic to epidemic cycles. So in South America, what we tend to see is large seasonal epidemics of dengue, whereas in Kenya, we see low levels of year-round transmission. And so given that they're along the equator and have a similar range of climates, 
can we describe these really wide ranging uh, dynamics that we see in the field using this single uh, model expression, essentially? Does it explain these very widely different dynamics? Um, and so the data from the sites, we had on-ground loggers measuring temperature, humidity, and rainfall. We had collections of vectors um, in Kenya from multiple life stages at multiple houses within each site um, every month. So really amazing data sets and a huge amount of effort and teams collecting these. And then human cases on dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Although what I'm presenting here is really dengue. Um, and for those in the audience who are more familiar with uh, the viruses, we confirm these through PCR or sero conversion. Um, but that's not super important if you don't know what that means. Um, and so <laughs> the, the quick answer in our first go was that the framework did a really poor job of describing the dynamics we found in the field. So we went back to the drawing board. This wasn't necessarily surprising, although we were hopeful it would describe real world dynamics. You know, having a model that's really driven from these lab experiments, it's not so surprising. So what we did was think about how humidity and rainfall might also influence the dynamics of the mosquito. So we added those into the model as well. Humidity is mostly straightforward. It, it uh, affects mosquito survival and not exactly linear, but close to linear way and has been pretty well studied in the lab. Rainfall turned out to be really interesting, but also tricky because if you can imagine, you can really cue in and modulate temperature in the lab really easily. It's really hard to simulate rainfall. <laughs> you can't really simulate in a, a little tank, you know, with mosquitoes going around different rates, different levels so easily that actually mimic real world conditions. Um, so before I get into what that looks like, um, because I know rainfall is a topic in several of the talks today, I thought I'd just let you give a short answer about what you know or what you think in terms of the relationship between rainfall and mosquitoes. Okay, so we have brings them out after it's over, promotes mosquitoes, increased proliferation, breeding habitats, provides improved breeding conditions, rain increases, impedes flight. Oh, that's an interesting one. More water for breeding, breeding. Depends on temperature. <laughs> Temperate rainforests have many. Uh, these are all great answers. Um, I see a lot of them uh, indicate breeding habitat, and that was our first thought as well. Um, the other ones are really associated to kind of the timing of when they'll come out after a rainfall event with brings them out after or promotes uh, increased proliferation. So yeah, I think these are all on this, the exact same track that we were thinking. And so basically what we did, because we didn't really have mechanistic uh, conditions that were measured in the lab, we instead tested a couple different functional relationships. And so what we looked at was three that I'm showing here. So on the x-axis is a cumulative rainfall metric in the past two weeks. And the y-axis is carrying capacity. So essentially, breeding, ax breeding habitat is associated with how many mosquitoes can be in the area. And so we looked at these three functions, which describe a lot of what was just brought um, what your answers were on the survey. So the first is the spree air, and what that suggests is that when there's little rainfall, you have low levels of mosquito abundances. As you increase the rainfall, you get an increasing number of mosquitoes, but you can get this really steep drop off because of flushing, which Aaron mentioned before. So these are mostly container breeding mosquitoes, and so if you have heavy rainfall, if, uh, if you have a cap of water or a little bucket, if you have heavy water, it can actually flush out the rainwater there that's needed for the mosquito to complete its life cycle. The quadratic in the equation in the middle is sort of a middle ground where we're saying we expect increased, gradual increasing with increasing rainfall, and then a gradual drop off as well. So you'll get overfilling of buckets, but it might not be this dramatic event where all the water is flushed out. And then the third is this inverse relationship. And to me, this is one of the most interesting aspects of 
I think dengue and chikungunya and Zika worldwide, which is that a lot of places, usually in lower income countries where people don't have pipe water to their homes, they end up storing water in buckets from wells or from rainwater. And what that can do in when you don't have many rain, much rain or in drought conditions is it can actually decouple the rainfall mosquito relationship because what you end up doing is having these small areas of water that concentrate mosquitoes and often concentrate them in or around the home, so close to, close to people. And so what we found actually is that rainfall is maybe not surprisingly, given the range of sites, really context specific. So though we think the mechanism between freshwater availability and the mosquito life cycle is consistent everywhere, how this plays out in the real world really differs based on human behavior. So this picture is just one uh, somewhat extreme example, I'd say, in one of the most rural sites in Kenya we worked at, where most people don't have pipe water to their home. And all I wanted you to see here is all the buckets laying around the home. Um, good on them, a, a number of them are actually turned upside down, so they're aware this is a problem. But you can see there's several turned up, and there's also some kind of non-use trash laying around that also fills with water. And so in places like that, we often found support for that inverse relationship. Whereas other places were not quite as built up as Boston, but you know, people have pipe water, they have air conditioning, and in those cases, you don't have these, this extreme inverse relationship. Okay, so once we added humidity and rainfall with temperature, we, we found some key characteristics of our viral outbreaks were actually highly predictable from this sort of simple SIR framework. The first is that we found the number of outbreaks closely aligned between our observations shown on the x-axis and our predictions shown on the y-axis. And each of the points represent a different site. You don't really need to worry about the colors and symbols, they just represent the different locations and countries. Um, and similarly, we found good support that we could predict the peak timing of the outbreak as well as how long the outbreak lasts is shown on the right. So those um, in the middle and right are, is actually the month of the year or the number of months that lasts. But we didn't find support for outbreak size. So we had a really hard time predicting the actual number of cases or abundance of mosquitoes at any given time, which are shown in here by the total size of the outbreak overall. So if you add up all the people that were infected or the maximum number of infections at any given time. And we think this gets at uh, the question we discussed earlier actually, which is, that we didn't include the immune dynamics in any sort of sophisticated way. Um, and I'm not really gonna talk about that because Nicole has some really exciting work that she's presenting next where she, she did include some more interesting and nuanced susceptible dynamics. Um, but based on this, we thought, well, even if we can't predict the exact number of people, for example, at any given time, what's also really relevant is understanding the, the variation in, uh, space and time. So the peaks and troughs, even if we don't get the numbers correct. So that's what we looked at next for all of the sites. Um, oh, that's just confirming what I just said. We, a couple of our hypotheses uh, made sense and some of them did not. So here's examples from just two of our sites. The gray points and lines connecting the points are showing our model predictions, and the overlaid black points and lines are the observations in the field. Now the top is showing the vector dynamics, and the bottom is showing the human dengue cases. And on the left, we have an example from a site in Ecuador where there's strong climate seasonality. And the right is showing an example site from Kenya uh, which is a place where there's weaker climate seasonality. And in general, what we found is that in sites with the strong climate seasonality, we did quite a good job at predicting the dynamics through time. We were able to really capture those peaks at the right times and the troughs at the right times. Whereas places with weaker seasonality, it was a little bit more hit or miss. We did capture some of those main peaks, which are really important, but there are also a number of times throughout those years where you see we predicted there should be higher abundances or higher cases when we actually didn't see any evidence of them in the data. 
And so this was interesting, but what I expected then was that, okay, well, in Ecuador where there's large seasonal epidemics, that means we can predict pretty well. And in places like Kenya where there's low levels of transmission, we're a bit out of luck. Um, but when we looked, what we found that I thought was a bit more interesting is that these strong seasonal patterns were actually consistent across coastal locations in both countries. And there was weaker seasonality in inland locations. And this is likely because at the ocean land interface, the atmosphere is a bit, there is some buffering of the climate signal. And so you get these clean climate signals. And so you get conditions conducive to transmission building up and then uh, reducing through time in more consistent ways. Whereas in inland locations, we're finding a lot of climate variability. And in a model that's solely dependent on climate, that made it really hard to predict conditions well. Um, so finally, we wanted to see, were there any other mediating factors, demographics or socioeconomics that might be affecting our ability to predict and maybe something to pursue as a follow-up project? Um, and so I'll just speak briefly about this because it's not the main uh, topic of this talk. Uh, but here what we found is that predictive accuracy at any given site shown on the y-axis was associated with uh, a larger percent of the population that was under five years old. And so this we don't think is directly associated with a place with a lot of young children, but overall places with um, kind of bottom heavy uh, pyramids have certain characteristics about them. For instance, a lot of them have higher mobility throughout the day, and so there's more exposure and um, opportunities for mosquitoes to grow, the population to grow. Um, second, we found a strong relationship with pipe water, where houses with uh, more houses with pipe water were more predictable. This, of course, completely separated by Kenya and Ecuador, um, so that was pretty much expected. And the third was also associated with housing quality, which we found sites with a larger percentage of homes made of cement. So again, none of these factors are likely related mechanistically to our ability to predict, but are indicative of some of the social and ecological factors that are associated with uh, the local conditions. So just to give a summary of this research, um, our first question we asked is what aspects of epidemics were predictable from these types of climate-driven models? And we found support that we should be able to, in fact, predict some key characteristics like the number, peak timing, and duration of outbreaks. But we couldn't predict epidemic size very well. Second, we found that predictability varied quite a bit when we're looking specifically over space and time at small locations. So for vectors, I only showed an example, but our predictability ranged from 28 to 85 percent and 44 to 80 percent for human disease dynamics. And we found overall that places with stronger climate seasonality led to more predictable epidemic dynamics, whereas places with weaker seasonality had less predictable and more endemic dengue dynamics. And then finally, we found that sites with fewer young children and houses with pipe water and made of cement actually impacted our ability to predict the vector dynamics overall. Um, and that is the end of my presentation on the first hour. So I don't know how we want to do this, but we're happy to take some questions now or wait till later. There's a question in chat, which I can't see the end of, so maybe. What is the prediction horizon for these models? For example, temperature, humidity today predicts de dengue X weeks in the future. That's a good question. So. If we're being irresponsible, we could predict as far into the future as we want. <laughs> um, I would say because this is a deterministic model, it's not, we haven't evaluated so much that specific relationship because I think what's more important actually is our confidence in the climate predictions that are driving the models. And so we tend to not really believe, for example, temperature forecasts too far out in the future. So I think one to three months is as far as I would really trust them. And that's more based on the weather conditions than the relationship between the mosquitoes and the weather variables themselves. Oh, maybe I should stand over here. 
I had, a, I had a question more about the mechanistic aspects. Does the does the virus put a uh, does, does is there a disease burden on the mosquitoes? Like, does it lead to, and is that significant at all? I love that question, um, and unfortunately, I can't answer it very well. Uh, so. It's surprising how few studies actually measure these traits in infected mosquitoes. And so we pretend that there's no effect, but whether that's true, I'm not entirely sure. And Erin, if you know of, you might know of some updated research where this has been looked at. Um, but yeah. as far as I'm aware, we don't really know the, the true effect of the virus on the mosquitoes themselves. Right, so the, the baseline assumption is that as vectors, they are not affected at all by the the virus or parasite, because, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you would expect the virus to not want to affect, not want to affect the, the um, mosquito very much because the mosquito needs to stay alive and continue functioning and biting. But some of the behavioral and life history research that's been done shows that infected vectors sometimes bite more frequently than uninfected vectors. With malaria, it's super interesting because infected vectors even have a preference based on smell for uninfected people and vice versa. And that's been shown with some plants and um, plant viruses and aphids as well. So there's this kind of co-evolutionary relationship. And there's also some studies suggesting that, you know, at our constant, you know, cozy laboratory conditions of 25 degrees Celsius, there doesn't appear to be any effect of virus infection on mosquito life history. But once you stress them at really warm temperatures, particularly, the mosquitoes that are infected do appear to die more quickly. So there, I think like the baseline assumption in almost all of these models is that vector survival is not affected by infection. But if we look a little bit more closely, I think there actually are some physiological effects. And I'd like to see that research being done. I've, I've been interested in that for a while. Okay, if there aren't any more questions right now, we'll take a five minute break, come back in five minutes for the second, uh, the second set of talks, which will be virtual. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, and many thanks to the organizers for letting me join over Zoom. Uh, to build on what was covered in the previous talks, I'll be talking about how nonlinear effects of climate and susceptibility interact to affecting gate dynamics. And with my current setup, I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions um, either at the end of this talk or in the discussion session later. So dengue epidemics occur when host and vector distributions and abundance align in space and time to enable vector host contact. Downstream processes such as pathogen development rate, a vector's competence to transmit the pathogen and host susceptibility also affect epidemic outcome. The primary mosquito vector, Edis aegypti, breeds in human-made containers, as mentioned previously, and so many hypothesize that rainfall might affect vector abundance and therefore disease risk. As mentioned in the previous talks, since mosquitoes are ectotherms, outdoor temperatures may also affect their abundance, survival, and vector competence. Temperature affects mosquito traits in experimental settings, and as shown in the previous talks, Traits-based mechanistic models use these experimental data and ultimately show a unimodal relationship between temperature and dengue spread, here shown using measured um, or using uh, relative r naught. However, the question remains, can this relationship be inferred from population level field data, especially when accounting for population level susceptibility? The rainfall dengue relationship is also unclear and context dependent as Jamie alluded to earlier. In some settings, drought could facilitate dengue transmission by promoting water storage that serves as standing water habitat for mosquitoes. In other settings, rainfall provides more container breeding habitat for mosquitoes, which increases mosquito abundance and dengue risk. But heavy rainfall can reduce mosquito abundance by flushing out larvae. So in the field, dengue transmission involves complex, nonlinear interactions between climate, vector, and host dynamics, which makes investigating climate drivers at the population level challenging. 
One potential reason for why there is inconsistent evidence about the climate impacts on dengue in the field is that the dynamics of the susceptible population might downplay any climate effects on dengue. However, because host population susceptibility is difficult to observe over time, the mechanisms of dengue dynamics at the population level remain elusive. To address this gap, we set out to answer these following questions. What are the mechanistic, nonlinear, and interdependent effects of temperature, rainfall, and population susceptibility on dengue incidents? And does this knowledge improve dengue forecasting? To address these questions, we used empirical dynamic modeling, a method that empirically derives nonlinear and interactive mechanisms from long time series data. We used weekly reports of dengue incidents, average temperature, and total amounts of rainfall in San Juan, Puerto Rico, spanning 19 years. Measuring the susceptible population over time is not feasible, so we used a proxy called the Susceptibles Index, which can be inferred from incidence data. By estimating these time-dependent growth rates lambda, which are proportional to the effective reproduction number during a time interval delta t. And since vector-borne disease models show that the effective reproduction number is proportional to the susceptible host and vector populations, we have that lambda is also proportional to the susceptible populations. And this lambda is the susceptibles index, here shown in purple. So we then used empirical dynamic modeling, or EDM for short, where we set all of these four time series as axes in multidimensional space and built an object through time called an attractor. This way, EDM unpacks the dynamics of our system and infers the nonlinear and interactive mechanisms directly from data. And to illustrate this better, I will play this introductory video to empirical dynamic modeling. Fingers crossed. This animation illustrates the Lorentz attractor. The Lorentz is an example of a coupled dynamic system consisting of three differential equations where each component depends on the state and dynamics of the other two components. You can think of each component, for example, as being species, foxes, rabbits, grasses, and each one changes depending on the state of the other two. So these components, shown here as the axes, are actually the state variables or the Cartesian coordinates that form the state space. Notice that when the system is in one lobe, x and z are positively correlated, and when the system is in the other lobe, x and z are negatively correlated, the other wing of the butterfly. We can view a time series thus as a projection from that manifold onto a coordinate axis of the state space. Here we see the projection onto axis x and the resulting time series recording displacements of x. This can be repeated on the other coordinate axes to generate other simultaneous time series. And so these time series are really just projections of the manifold dynamics onto coordinate axes. Conversely, we can recreate the manifold by projecting the individual time series back into the state space to create the flow. And in this panel, we can see the three time series, x, y, and z, each of which is really a projection of the motion on that manifold, and what we're doing is the opposite here. We are taking the time series and projecting them back into the original three-dimensional state space to recreate the manifold the butterfly attractor. So, to see whether climate effects on dengue incidents can be inferred from these time series, we first constructed shadow attractors, which are attractors that are built using just one of the time series variables, for example, incidence. The first dimension is the raw incidence time series, and the second dimension is the incidence time series lag by some time tau, and the third dimension is incidence lag by two tau, and so on. Tocken's theorem states that there is a one-to-one -one relationship 
between the original attractor and the shadow attractors. So we can infer dynamics of the whole system by just analyzing a shadow attractor. And to illustrate this concept better, I'll show this next video. And for the purpose of this talk, a manifold is the same as an attractor, even though there are slight differences between the two terms. There's a very powerful theorem proven by Floris Tarkins that shows generically that one can reconstruct a shadow version of the original manifold simply by looking at one of its time series projections. For example, consider the three time series shown here. These are all copies of each other. They are all copies of variable x. Each is displaced by an amount tau. So the top one is unlagged, the second one is lagged by tau, and the blue one at the bottom is lagged by 2 tau. Tarkin's theorem then says that we should be able to use these three time series as new coordinates and reconstruct a shadow version of the original butterfly manifold. So let's see how this works. This is the reconstructed manifold produced from lags of a single variable, and you can see that it actually does look fairly similar to the butterfly attractor. Each point in the three-dimensional reconstruction can be thought of as a time segment with different points capturing different segments of history of variable x. And the reconstructed manifold is then the library or collection of the historical behavior of x. The reconstruction preserves essential mathematical properties of the original system, such as the topology of the manifold and its Lyapunov exponents. More importantly, this method represents a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold, the butterfly attractor, and the reconstruction, allowing us to recover states of the original dynamic system by using lags of just a single time series. So. We built a shadow attractor using only Denga incidence data and performed a series of nearest neighbor regressions on the incidence shadow attractor. By doing so, we can infer the temperature time series, for example, or at least a close approximation of it, but only if temperature is driving incidence since the Denga shadow attractor will contain information about its drivers. This EDM method is called convergent cross mapping. And I will show a final video that explains how it got its name. Taken's theorem gives us a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold and reconstructed shadow manifolds. Here, we will explain how this important aspect of attractor reconstruction can be used to determine if two time series variables belong to the same dynamic system and are thus causally related. This particular reconstruction is based on lags of variable x. If we now do the same for variable y, we find something similar. Here, we see the original manifold m, as well as the shadow manifolds mx and my, created from lags of x and y respectively. Because both mx and my map one-to-one -to, -one to the original manifold m, they also map one-to-one -to, -one to each other. This implies that the points that are nearby on the manifold my correspond to points that are also nearby on mx. We can demonstrate this principle by finding the nearest neighbors in my and using their time indices to find the corresponding points in mx. These points will be nearest neighbors on mx only if x and y are causally related. Thus, we can use nearby points on MY to identify nearby points on MX. This allows us to use the historical record of Y to estimate the states of X and vice versa, a technique we call cross-mapping. With longer time series, the reconstructed manifolds are denser, nearest neighbors are closer, and the cross-map estimates increase in precision. We call this phenomenon convergent cross-mapping and use this convergence as a practical criterion for detecting causation. So, as mentioned in the video, the key criterion for detecting driver effects in EDM is called convergence, meaning that as you add more data, in our case incidence data, the prediction scale of the climate driver time series increases and saturates at a plateau, as seen here for rainfall in blue. The blue shaded region represents results from bootstrapped time series fragments. 
and the gray line and shaded region are the mean and 95% confidence interval of a null distribution where the seasonal trend was conserved, but the year-to-year -year anomalies were randomly shuffled. The blue line is above the gray region, indicating that rainfall is indeed driving incidence beyond its seasonal signal at the population level. On the other hand, temperature may drive incidence mostly by its seasonal signal, because although the red line shows convergence, it does overlap with the seasonal distribution. So now that we have established that there is a signal of climate effects on dengue from population level field data, can we then infer the shape of that relationship at the population level? To do this, we assess the effect of a small change in temperature or rainfall on dengue incidence across different states of the system, meaning at different locations on the attractor, <clears throat> constructed using both incidents, denoted here by, by Y, and a climate driver time series, either that of temperature or rainfall, here denoted by X. The outcome of these small changes allowed us to deduce the relationship between each climate driver and dengue incidence and how it depends on susceptible availability. We found that when susceptibles index is below 0.85, there are really no effects of temperature or rainfall on incidence, here showing the rate of change against temperature or rainfall. So temperature in red and rainfall in blue. The solid lines are median regression lines and the dashed lines are the fifth and 95th percentile regression lines. But when the susceptibles index is above 0.85, we can see some rate of change against temperature or rainfall. So the susceptible population size modulates temperature and rainfall effects on dengue. For temperature, the rate of change is mostly positive, unimodal, and peaking around 25 or 26 degrees, which suggests that temperature has a positive and potentially unimodal relationship with dengue. Rainfall shows a nonlinear negative relationship with dengue because the rate of change is negative and keeps decreasing. So if we can incorporate the inferred nonlinear climate effects on dengue incidents and their dependency on the susceptible population size, would that yield good forecasting of dengue epidemics? Using EDM again, which incorporates all the nonlinear and interdependent relationships between all the variables encapsulated in the data, we built, we built uh, forecasting models, which were essentially the attractors themselves and performed nearest neighbor regressions on each attractor to predict dengue cases eight weeks ahead into the future. And the forecast variance was derived from the density of the attractor and the volume of the nearest neighbor cluster. So our first model, uh, where we only included the climate drivers, uh, we had that the correlation uh, between predicted and observed dengue incidents, shown in black, was about 0.4. The teal line is the forecasting mean, and the shaded region is the 90% confidence interval, as shown here. The climate drivers are at least capturing the epidemic seasonality. But when we added the susceptibles index into our forecasting model, the fit improved, especially for capturing uh, epidemic peaks suggesting that accounting for the susceptible population size and how it interacts with climate is important for dengue forecasting. And these models performed well, even when tested on external out of sample data from four additional years. So to conclude, we found that temperature and rainfall drive dengue dynamics at the population level, but only when the susceptible population is large enough. And the effects are indeed nonlinear as supported by previous trait based mechanistic models. And we have also shown that empirically derived nonlinear and interdependent effects between predictors is important for dengue forecasting. So, finally, I'd like to thank these following co authors and funding sources for their support. And thank you for listening. And I'll now hand it over to Devin. Nicole, do you want to take any questions now? Uh, 
Yeah, okay. I can take some questions now or, or after Devin's talk. I, I, I do have one question. Just uh, the sensitivity, it seemed like the sensitivity to the susceptible population was, there was a, a strong effect, particularly that cutoff. Do you have a sort of idea of what the, the relative curve um, does that make sense? Like how, how much does the, uh, the sort of size of the epidemic or whatever other metric vary as the susceptible population changes, right? There's like this strong drop off, for example, in temperature uh, as it increases. Do you see the same sort of thing where, you know, interventions at a particular place would be most useful in terms of, uh, you know, at certain points in the susceptible population curve? Um, I mean, that, that is a great question. And yes, the short answer is that um, obviously the, the fluctuations of, of the size of the susceptible population over time does have uh, actual very big effects on, on the epidemic size and, and when it peaks. Um, that, that is not something that we were necessarily investigating um, for this project. Um, but that, that is like more of a, of a given that that is the case, at least in the, in the disease ecology literature. And so we're just like mostly, uh, focused on, well, do these, uh, big changes in, in susceptibility over time sort of overshadow any of the climate effects that, that might have, or that might exist. And so we were just happy to see that we were actually able to, to, um, you know, see some of those climate effects, um, despite the fact that, you know, the, the susceptible population dynamics over time uh, overall do have uh, much bigger effects on, on dengue epidemic size. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our, our next and final speaker. Uh, so, hi everyone, it's great to join you from Vancouver this morning to continue this uh, research theme of climate and dengue. And so for this project, we're taking a metal analytical approach to see if we can detect signatures uh, and temperature impacts in the field on dengue. And so the effects of temperature are different across different disease systems. And we can look at two really simple examples to make that clear. So this first example, we have a marine crab uh, barnacle, and then we have a barnacle parasite, which you can see underneath the crab, so it castrates the parasite. And in this system, research has shown that warmer temperatures lead to decreased disease. And we can contrast this to a um, freshwater Daphnia fungal parasite system. And so here, you can see in the Daphnia's head and somewhat through its entire body, we have these fungal spores. And in this system, it's pretty clear as we get warmer temperatures, we generally get increased disease. So this is just two simple examples, but we know that the effects of temperature can differ across systems. However, such, since dengue is such a well-studied disease system, it actually allows us to ask if and why effects of temperature can vary within the system and whether we actually observe this across time and space. And so if we think about why temperature may impact the same disease differently across time and space, I think we can consider three different types of uh, broad categories of these mediators. And the first one, as we've seen today throughout several talks is nonlinearity. And so nonlinear trait responses, and so this probably looks familiar, uh, can lead to nonlinear effects of temperature on disease. And often when we're thinking about this, uh, we might be thinking of it at a certain location. And so if we're in this one location and temperature increases, we might expect increased disease and then as temperature goes past the optimum, it might decrease. However, we could also take a step back and think about this a bit differently. So if we consider different human populations across time and space, uh, if we go to one location where the average temperature is relatively cool and researchers do, uh, they look for a correlation between temperature and dengue here, we might expect to see a positive correlation because of the average temperature that they're doing their study in. However, if different researchers went somewhere else and tried to uh, repeat the same study with an average temperature that's warmer up here, we might actually expect them to find a negative correlation. 
this is the first kind of broad category for why temperature impacts on dengue may change. The second category, these mediators, um, are other climatic factors beyond mean temperature. So for dengue, we have a couple uh, hypotheses. First, we expect that temperature variability uh, should actually make the effects of mean temperature easier to observe. We also hypothesize that precipitation may mediate how temperatures impact being dengue. However, for this one, we weren't quite sure which direction to expect. Um, and as we've seen in the talks already today, it's because some of these effects um, can be really um, system specific. And so we might expect higher precipitation. Uh, well, we do affect, expect it to affect available breeding habitat. And so it could either increase or decrease temperature effects depending on whether the system is rain or drought. And the final kind of broad category of factors that may have, might mediate how temperatures affecting the dengue uh, are socioeconomic factors. And in this case, all of these have something in common. They all can alter the size of the potential epidemic for when temperature conditions are optimal, thereby increasing or decreasing the potential strength of temperature impacts. And so a couple of examples, we might expect higher density should increase temperature effects because there'd be a larger epidemic potential. Higher GDP, if we use that as a proxy um, for things like infrastructure and mosquito control. So if we have higher GDP, we might expect it to dampen potential effects of temperature. And finally, average dengue burden. We also expect that um, higher dengue burden should decrease potential temperature effects. Um, and that's because as we heard in mean, Aaron's response to one of the questions today, uh, infection with a certain serotype then confers immunity. And so if we have there's generally higher dengue burden in a location, we might expect there to be less susceptibles and therefore have smaller temperature effects when these temperatures become more optimal. So this leads to our three questions for this project. First, just do we observe variation in field correlations between temperature and dengue? If yes, are these correlations nonlinear with average temperature as predicted by ecological theory? And this ecological theory uh, is this, these trait-based models that Aaron talked about earlier today. Then finally, do other climatic or socioeconomic factors also explain variation in correlation strength? So to get at this, uh, we built a database. We conduct, conducted a systematic literature review for studies that estimated correlations between temperature and dengue. Uh, for this, we got 358 correlations from 38 different accepted studies. We can have more correlations than studies because some studies uh, either report correlations across multiple locations or they might report uh, multiple correlations in the same place using different temperature metrics like minimum temperature that month or average temperature that month. Um, and finally, they might report different correlations um, for different legs between temperature and dengue. Next, we actually use Google Earth Engine to extract remote sense data on uh, temperature, precipitation, and population density for the location and duration that each study took place while weighting the data by population density for where people actually live. And so this allowed us to have um, a consistent measure of the average temperature and these other factors like precipitation for each location that studies occurred in. And finally, we also matched each study uh, with country level GDP and country level dengue burden. So if we look at the data, the first thing we see, so this is our estimated correlations, uh, 358 across the 38 studies, just generative so you can see it. The first thing we see is that there is a lot of variation in what's reported in the literature. So we have about 18% of these points are negative correlations, so 82% positive, ranging from uh, minus 0.7 all, all the way almost up. So we have a lot of variation, um, and you can see here a map of where these studies take place. Uh, so across like seven different global health regions in South and Southeast Asia and Oceania, and then Central America and South America and the Caribbean. Uh, and so, and the studies that generated this data are using dengue data and temperature data spanning from about the early 1980s to more recent. So we can already answer our first question: Do we actually observe variation in field correlations? And it's definitely yes. So now we want to see if we can explain this first using uh, ecological theory about how we expect these to be nonlinear with temperature, and then secondly with climatic or socioeconomic factors. So 
So we get into the nonlinearity question. We fit mixed effects models to see if the average temperature of the, that a study took place in could explain the correlations that they're finding. And then specifically, um, if this would peak near the temperature that we expected. And so just as a reminder, this mean study temperature here on the x-axis, this is, um, we're extracting this separately from the study using Google Earth Engine, so they're all using the same metric. And this figure, uh, Nicole just showed it in her uh, presentation, but since we have an optimal temperature, our ecological theory predicts an optimal temperature around 29 degrees, we expect the max rate of change or the strongest correlations to occur near 25 degrees, um, if this theory is correct. So we can look at the model residuals and fitted model here. We see that yes, uh, a significant amount of variation in the correlations is explained by average study temperature. It's nonlinear. Uh, this p value is just comparing the nonlinear model uh, to our null model without temperature. And then it peaks actually really close to the 25 degrees um, as predicted by our trait based model. I think there's also a couple other interesting things to point out here. Um, so first, what this what this means, this means that studies that are occurring at relatively cool or relatively warm locations are likely to find either weak or negative correlations between temperature and dengue. Whereas studies in this intermediate range are much more likely to find stronger correlations. Second, we found we actually were able to find this pattern over a relatively narrow range of mean temperatures, right? So the vast majority of the data is about 22 to 27 degrees average climate. Originally, when we started this project, I thought we'd be able to test if correlations become strongly negative past 29 degrees, right? Because we might expect negative correlations over here. Um, however, the issue, of course, is that very few locations with dengue actually have average temperatures over 30 degrees across these long time spans that these studies are operating in. And so we don't have any field studies to compare in this really hot temperature range, yet we were still able to find this nonlinearity across this relatively small range. So yes, we do see that correlations are nonlinear with average temperature as predicted by ecological theory. So our final question is, can temperature impacts on dengue be mediated by these other climatic or socioeconomic factors? And so just as a reminder, we're not actually asking if GDP or population density or precipitation affect dengue itself, or whether or not they affect temperatures affect on dengue. And our hypotheses were that we'd see stronger correlations, and there's lower infection burden, higher population density, lower GDP, higher temperature variation, and we weren't sure yet about precipitation. So at first, we hope to just be able to plug all of these different predictors into a model and see how they affect uh, these reported correlations. However, we found that many of these, maybe not surprisingly, many of these predictors are strongly correlated with each other. And so we instead settled on a principal component analysis approach with Veramax rotation, which I'll just quickly walk through. So some of you may already be familiar with uh, PCA. It's commonly used for dimensionality reduction, uh, where it projects the data points uh, into coordinate space by using fewer dimensions than the original data set. So, the cartoon I'm showing here is just a really simplified version showing a few data points with just two principal components. Um, but when you do this type of analysis, you don't actually have to limit it to only two dimensions. So typical PCA arranges these axes uh, to maximize the amount of variation explained by the first principal component, the second most by the second, and then so on into the third and fourth dimensions. However, for us, uh, we're actually much more interested in having components that are strongly associated with these different predictors so that we can have better interpretability at the end. And so what we can do is this Veramax rotation, which leaves the projected data uh, in the same coordinate space, but then rotates the axes to, to maximize the sum of the squared loadings of these points. And so the main takeaway is that this actually gives us better interpretability when we use these axes and components in our subsequent regressions. And so for us, this, is, this cartoon only shows the two dimensions, but we did it using four different components. Um, and so we were able to reduce our seven previously correlated predictors into four uncorrelated components 
Our first one has a negative association with infection burden and positive with temperature variability and population density. So what that means is we're not gonna be able to parse out how each of these are affecting correlations, but we can look at if as a group they are. Second, uh, mean and variability in precipitation. Third is our nonlinear mean temperature. And fourth, it has a negative association with GDP and positive with population density. And so then what we did is we ran 10,000 bootstrap regressions. Um, so our response variable in these regressions is the correlations between temperature and dengue that's reported in the literature. And then our predictors are these four rotated components as well as study factors uh, such as the type of temperature predictor that a study used or their data temporal resolution and things like that. And so here I can just, I'll show you the, the mean and the 95% confidence intervals on the estimated effect of each of these components. Um, so the boxes at the top are just to remind you which uh, predictors are associated with which component. And so first we found a significant positive effect of component one. And so this supports uh, three of our hypotheses First, we see stronger correlations with lower infection burden. And as a reminder, that's because this component is negatively associated with infection burden and then positive effects of temperature variability and population density. We see negative effects of precipitation. Um, so reminder, we weren't sure beforehand which direction to expect these effects since some dengue systems may be water limited or drought limited, um, but these results tell us at higher rainfall decreases temperatures effects on dengue. As expected, we found a, a very strong positive effect of nonlinear average temperature on dengue, right? So stronger correlations near 25 degrees, which is what we found in our, our previous analysis. And finally, we did not uh, see significant effects of GDP on correlations as we might've expected. So all in all, our hypotheses were generally supported for how these factors can mediate temperatures effects. Okay, so the conclusions and I think a couple next steps. So we did find that temperature effects of dengue are nonlinear and mediated by external factors, but can also be predicted by trait-based models and ecological theory. So it's not, it's not just random how these different factors um, are having effects. Second, I think recognizing and expanding these findings to other disease systems will help predict how temperature affects um, disease under climate change. And so while the specific shape of the nonlinearity um, or the specific external mediators that are having impacts may differ in other disease systems, I think it's gonna be, um, I think often they will have impacts. So that's because the vast majority of disease systems have similar underlying physiology that is shaped by temperature, um, often in nonlinear ways. The correlations we analyzed here, they don't, they're not able to isolate the effects of temperature. And so originally we had intended um, to also analyze observed coefficients uh, between temperature and dengue. So if a study uh, fit a regression model where they're um, predicting the exact effect of a one degree increase of temperature on dengue. We were hoping to use those, but we quickly realized in our literature review um, that the underlying models that were generating those data across different studies were too different to be able to properly compare, um, which is why we use correlations. But ideally, I think going forward, uh, we'd be able to look across many places while controlling for these additional factors, all kind of using the same modeling framework. And so that would really able to allow us to isolate the effects of temperature across time and space. And the reason that's actually important is that isolating these metrics, uh, such as how dengue changes with a one degree increase is really critical um, for things like the social cost of carbon calculations used by the US federal government uh, when setting policy. Uh, and this project was part of a working group from a University of British Columbia catalysis grant, along with all of these great collaborators. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the audience? Um, no, so this is Aaron. I'm going to jump in and do a little wrap up at the end, but if there are any specific questions for Devin, we can do those questions now.
before I kind of bring it all back together. Uh, I mean, I have a quick question, which is, uh, do these models, do you think they, well, on the, you know, what you've gathered, uh, do they provide guidance on sort of the best uh, interventions that might be possible in, under different settings? Do you feel like they, they, that there are different sort of interventions that would work better in different settings that you can understand from this data? I, I think that that might be another step away almost because here we're, at first, we're still really trying to understand at least in, in this study, um, how these things are affecting that relationship between temperature and dengue, but that doesn't that a stronger relationship between temperature and dengue won't necessarily always correspond to higher cases or higher disease burden. So I think at least from, from this perspective of the study, it would be a kind of another step to map it from how these things are affecting this relationship and then how that relationship is then being translated into actual higher or lower disease cases. And so I think you kind of need to uh, put all that together if you really wanted to, um, to craft smart interventions. Yeah, maybe I could jump in and add a little bit more. I think the types of interventions that are available to control dengue are, they range from really short-term reactive measures like indoor residual spraying or, you know, house-to-house -house vector control campaigns where they knock on the door and encourage people to flip their containers or cover their containers or whatever um, to, you know, those, they could also include biomedical interventions, although there's not a broadly effective dengue vaccine available. There is a dengue vaccine that's been approved, but it has some limitations based on some of the, the issues with antibody dependent enhancement that we discussed earlier. So it's not recommended for a lot of populations. Um, and there aren't really specific biomedical treatments for dengue virus either. It's really supportive care. So um, ideally, you want to be in a preventative rather than reactive scenario. And you know, we, we know already the types of places that tend to have big outbreaks, and those tend to be places like Jamie was discussing that have unreliable access to piped water, lots of water storage around the home, um, you know, home construction that's that's permeable to vectors, so vectors can come in and bite you. These are day biting vectors, so um, exposure at school or work appears to potentially be important in some settings. So um, I think combating the socioeconomic disparities that lead to these very poor housing conditions and poor living conditions is kind of the bigger picture target. But on the shorter term, there are, there are strategies like genetically modified mosquitoes and Wolbachia transfected mosquitoes that can be refractory to infection or can lead to population crashes. And those types of tools can be useful in sort of a localized setting for preventing dengue transmission, but they require a lot of resource investment. So, you know, debatably, if you're going to invest that kind of resources, you could invest it more sustainably in, in infrastructure for people's quality of life. Um, I'm not sure these results totally inform <laughs> that directly, but I do think they can help us to tailor our estimates of where the effects of climate change and exacerbating dengue will be most extreme. And also our attribution, you know, in which cases is a major dengue outbreak or chikungunya or Zika or whatever the next emerging arbovirus is, when can we attribute those to climate events versus kind of socioeconomic events? Um, and that climate attribution is a really important kind of future direction as well that I know Jamie and some other people are, are working on trying to understand as well. Um, okay, so I'll jump in and do a wrap up of these four sections and add a little bit more on what we project about climate change. And then I think we have some time at the end for more open discussion about the, the talks considered together. So um, the final research question that we want to address here is what is the relationship what is the relationship between temperature and dengue that mechanistic relationship that we've been talking about all day what does that predict about the impact of climate change so this is a map of a very simple index of the current temperature suitability for dengue transmission it's just the number of months per year that are within that suitable temperature range of 23 to 32 degrees celsius so it's a very coarse estimate we're assuming that any temperature between 23 and 32 on average is enough to, to sustain dengue ep epidemics, which is supported by some of that theory that Jamie uh, showed earlier. What we see, not that surprisingly, is that 
These suitable temperature windows, so the year-round transmission is shown in red, and the, the shorter, more seasonal windows of transmission are shown in the cooler colors like green and blue. We can see that the year-round transmission is largely restricted to the tropics, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Notably, Sub-Saharan Africa does have a pretty substantial rate of transmission of dengue, but it's highly underreported because it tends to be misdiagnosed as malaria or otherwise just sort of not considered as a major disease burden. So this is the current climate suitability based on our model um, and a, a very coarse estimate, not controlling for other factors like the occurrence of the vector or what you know those complicated rainfall relationships or so on this is the temperature suitability for 80s aegypti transmission of dengue under the most conservative future climate scenario by 2050 so this is a conservative emission scenario where we really cut back I guess, depending on how you want to view that, it could be sort of the most optimistic emission scenario where we really cut back on emissions by 2050. Even under that scenario, we see some global expansions in the temperature suitability for dengue. Particularly if you focus on the red, you can see the red areas expanding in uh, parts of, of South America, moving up in the Caribbean and Central America, moving up in latitude away from the equator towards and away from the equator in sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see those expansions in the southern parts of India and Southeast Asia, as well as parts of Australia. So we do see some pretty substantial geographic expansions in the number of months per year that are suitable for dengue transmission. So potentially uh, more suitable climate conditions year round. What about the numbers of people that are affected by these temperatures that are newly at risk? So. We calculated this metric of the number of people newly at risk because we figured that there's sort of a qualitative difference between living in an area where dengue is already endemic or seasonally epidemic and being exposed year after year and having some sort of familiarity with the disease, how it's transmitted, public health and, and vector control activities going on versus ranges, regions where people have not experienced dengue before and the public health systems are not prepared to deal with it. So this is calculating the, the number of people who live in regions that are expected to become suitable for the first time for dengue transmission under different, these are called representative concentration pathways over here. These are different emission scenarios. So the ones with the lower emissions, so lower amounts of, car, uh, of climate climate change are shown over here on the left. And as we move towards the right, these are the 8.5 is what's called the business as usual scenario. So if we don't change anything about our carbon emissions, we'll have the most climate change. And these are the number of billions of people newly at risk. So billions of, well, okay, so it's, it's a fractional billion. So it's hundreds of millions of new people newly at risk of dengue transmission. And this is by 2050, by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. This is not even considering the potential for Aedes albopictus. And what we see here is that depending on the emission scenario, between about 500 and 800 million, million new people are projected to become at risk of dengue transmission. If we look at this on the map, these circles, the size of the circle is proportional to the number of people newly at risk. So we can see the spatial distribution under two of these scenarios. The kind of middle of the road scenario is the 4.5 and the more extreme scenario business as usual is the 8.5. And under both of these scenarios, we see dramatic expansions in the number of people newly at risk. So again, hundreds of millions of people on the order of 200 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa alone. So that region like Kenya where Jamie was talking about earlier, as as well as places like North America. Now the dot is hovering over the Pacific Northwest. That's not where we're going to see a lot of dengue expansions. Instead, we're going to see a lot of people newly at risk in places like the Southeast, where we've already seen some local dengue transmission in Florida and parts of Texas and Hawaii, but also spreading further north into parts of the Southeastern US where these mosquitoes are already present. They're also present in, in parts of California. And if we look in Asia, we see dramatic expansions in places like China, um, as well as even moving into Russia. In Europe, we see dramatic expansions in people at risk, particularly under those highest emission scenarios. So what this suggests is that although there's a nonlinear relationship between temperature and dengue transmission, because that optimal temperature is so warm at 29 degrees Celsius, we're primarily expecting to see expansions of dengue risk into the future. A lot of the tropics are already highly suitable year round, but with climate warming, we're expecting to see those highly suitable year round or long seasons of transmission expanding into places like parts of Europe, North America, 
and parts of Asia where they haven't previously been experienced. Now, this mosquito currently isn't very well known outside of the tropics, but it actually already has been introduced and has been expanding into parts of, for example, North America and Europe. So this is an important future vector-borne disease risk, not just for the tropics and subtropics, but also in more temperate zones, in the same way that we've seen West Nile virus emerge, for example, in, in more northern parts of North America. So bringing all this back together, how is climate change affecting dengue dynamics? I'll just summarize the key results from the different parts of the talk. First, we, effect, we found that the, when we look mechanistically, the effects of temperature on dengue transmission are nonlinear. And that's not just because there's different monotonic effects of temperature that oppose each other on different traits, but actually the fact that each individual trait of the mosquito and the virus responds nonlinearly to temperature. And when we put all those together, we get an overall nonlinear relationship between temperature and dengue. We see that this temperature dengue relationship peaks at 26 degrees Celsius for Aedes albopictus and 29 degrees Celsius for Aedes aegypti. What we really discovered with a lot of these comparisons between field data and mechanistic models is that although the peak temperature for dengue transmission is 29 degrees Celsius, we see the strongest effects of temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, which is what we would expect by looking at the steepness of this curve here that relates transmission to temperature. So that's where we see that highest rate of influence of temperature on dengue, around 25 degrees Celsius. And these nonlinear effects of temperature are apparent in the field. So surprisingly, given how complicated and messy and nonlinear and dynamic these systems are, we actually can recover these nonlinear mechanistic effects of temperature on transmission, suggesting that temperature is an important driver of dengue transmission dynamics in the field. And it is at least moderately predictable based on estimates from the laboratory of how mosquitoes respond to temperature. We also find that climate and host susceptibility, so the availability of susceptible people specifically, help us to explain both the occurrence and the dynamics of these arboviruses, including dengue, as well as chikungunya and Zika that are also transmitted by the same mosquito. So in the first part, I showed this pretty coarse scale analysis at the country level, showing that population corrected R0 versus temperature was a good predictor of how many cases you saw in a local outbreak. And then Jamie showed that epidemic dynamics, at least the timing, duration, and number of outbreaks was highly predictable from mechanistic, climate-driven dynamic models. And then finally, Nicole showed that dengue dynamics were highly predictable with these time series reconstruction approaches, particularly when we had information about host susceptibility. And so, of course, that's the most challenging thing to measure in the field. We can remotely sense rainfall and temperature, but it's very difficult to get a direct estimate of host susceptibility. So Nicole presented that new method for inferring an index of host susceptibility if we have past information on dengue incidents. And then finally, the impacts of climate change are likely to expand at least the climate suitability for dengue transmission and the number of people at risk. But it's important to revisit models like that Messina et al. model that I showed at the beginning, which includes not only these temperature suitability metrics refined to better incorporate the mechanistic relationships, but also important things like human mobility, the occurrence of the vector, the socioeconomic conditions that promote transmission, and so on. So this temperature metric is kind of one dimension of the climate response, and the realized response is going to depend on the suite of other factors. And finally, I want to show you this picture. So uh, one of our collaborators, Desiree Lebeau, has started a nonprofit in Kenya working to address the socio, environmental, and planetary health crisis of plastics. And plastics are a major driver of dengue transmission, uh, you know, water insecurity, poor housing quality, but also this kind of avalanche of uncontrolled, undisposed plastic. And what happens in, the, in places like this in Kenya is that people have access to cheap disposable plastic just like we do here, water bottles, you know, containers that are meant to be thrown away. Except in that context, there's not adequate sanitation, recycling, or trash services to take all this plastic away and dispose of it properly. So it ends up getting kind of dumped. And it becomes this obviously huge environmental disaster. But also these plastics, when Desiree surveyed children in these communities, she, she tasked them, school children, with going out and finding mosquitoes breeding in their environments. And the children came back with mosquitoes that had breeding, been breeding in these dumps. 
And so what they found is that plastic is a huge, um, these disposable plastic dumps are a huge driver of dengue dynamics, particularly in these very low income places that, that Desiree has been working, and particularly in places where people are forced to store water because they don't have access to reliable piped water. So dengue is really a disease of unplanned urbanization as well as environmental degradation. So it's not just about climate, it's about the other impacts that humans are having on the environment, and especially these social inequities involved in environmental degradation. And therefore, the future risk of dengue transmission depends partly on climate, but in much larger part, it depends on our choices around uh, the availability of adequate housing, piped water, um, trash collection, and recycling services. So this nonprofit, HERI, shown up here, is a nonprofit involved in trying to find sustainable ways of recycling and repurposing plastics within the community and educating the community on how to, how to create sustainable livelihoods based on recycling these plastics and reducing the disease risk. So this is the kind of, I think, um, community-based and inspiring type of approach, speaking of interventions, that can be really powerful for reducing dengue risk. So that's the end of our research talk. Thank you very much. And I think we are gonna open it up to broader discussion now.